This morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 13, 14, and 15. This morning, as our goal will be to navigate through three of these very meaty chapters of Scripture. And if you're new this morning, if you're just joining us, we are on our way leaving captivity through the book of Exodus and the people's uh, Israelites uh, leaving and fleeing captivity of the Egyptians. We've seen over the past few weeks that the, Egyptian, or the Israelites have been in captivity for 430 years. And here through the course of the plagues, God has finally, or Pharaoh has finally relented. And the Hebrews are leaving captivity. And so this is where we're going to pick up. And I'm going to read for us Exodus chapter 14, 10 through 18. And so if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word, Exodus chapter 14, and I'll read 10 through 18. And I think that'll give us a good covering of what we're going to look at this morning. So Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 18 is what I'll read and what would be on the screen. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm. And see the salvation of the Lord, which, will work, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Lord, we ask that these words would guide our thoughts this morning. That you would open and illuminate our hearts for the word to be poured in. With the words of my mouth. In the meditation of my heart this morning, Lord, would they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and you are our redeemer. Would we leave this sanctuary and this church today different than when we walked in? Lord, we love you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. And all God's people said, amen. You can be seated. So we know here this morning that the Israelites have been in captivity for 430 years. Uh, through the plagues and all the Passover, or the Passover and the, the coming of the um, angel of death into the land, Pharaoh has finally relented and let the people go. And this is where we pick up our story. And so number one on your outline, if you have your small half sheet of paper, the, the number one on your outline is God's leading. Let's explore God's leading for just a moment. You see in Exodus chapter 13, verse, um, what is it, verse 17, you see that when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Now, this is a, a puzzling little statement by God, right? You would think that if God's going to lead the people out of captivity, this is what they've been praying for for years and years, Lord, lead us out of captivity. The Lord's not going to lead them through the land of the Philistines, which was the nearer pathway, but he's going to lead them into the wilderness. Uh, that seems a little tricky, right? Because after all, we know, we know, did God not lead them to the Philistines? Do we not think that God's not able to totally decimate the Philistine army, right? We've seen him do it in, in times uh, to come. We'll see him, right, march the people around the walls of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. You remember that whole little story? That song, right? God marches the people around Jericho. The walls come tumbling down and the people just go in and take the land. We'll see in just a moment that God would part the Red Sea and the Egyptian army would be swallowed up instantaneously. Do we think that God couldn't send the people into the Philistine nation for fear that the Philistines would overwhelm the Israelites? Certainly not so. Certainly the Philistines are not so great and mighty a war people that God could not overcome them. So why would God detour the people around the Philistines through the wilderness? 
I would contend to us that God did this out of graciousness for the people. That God in his great grace and mercy and kindness to the Israelite people would not send them through the Philistine encampment, but would send them around it into the wilderness, recognizing the frailty of their flesh and the weakness of their spirit. As you look and see what God says, he said, lest we go through the Philistines and they see the war-torn people and all of a sudden begin to say, send us back to Egypt, send us back, we can't do this. I mean, we see in the book of Numbers, this is precisely what they do when they get to Canaan, right? In Numbers chapter 14, the people wept all night and they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They said, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt. And I find this a fascinating trademark of who our God is. That recognizing the flesh and frailty of the people, he would choose to detour them down a different pathway for their own good and for their own spirit. I mean, we do this as parents, right? As a father and going out, I love to go outside and I love to hike and love to be out in nature. And there are times when you take the kids and you're over there looking at the trail map and you say, three miles, this looks awesome, let's go everybody. And about a mile in, you look on the faces of your kids and say, we're not going to make it about four more steps. And you have choices to make, right? Do you say, kids, you will go, you will make it through, knowing that their spirits are just getting dampened every step that they take. Or do you say, you know what, I'm going to put them on my back and I'm going to carry them. Or to say, you know what, I I want them to make it. We're going to detour them down another pathway that's going to get them to the place that they need to go maybe a little quicker or a little better. And do you see even in this moment the kindness of the Lord to detour them around this war-torn nation to say, I, I know that they can't handle it. I know that even though I can decimate the Philistines, it's not what they need at this time. But I want you for a moment to also look at it from the Israelites' perspective. They're praying, Lord, release us from captivity. God's finally done it, right? And then all of a sudden they think, I mean, we're we're going. This is going to be awesome. And then all of a sudden here they are wandering in the wilderness. Can you not see them saying, God, what are you doing? Come on, Lord. This is not where we want to be. We don't want to be in the desert. We don't want to be in the wilderness. But all the while, in his kindness, God has led them there. Uh, Away from the Philistines, away from Egypt. His kindness has led them into the wilderness. And I'm sure if the Israelites could be writing their journal notes right here, they would be saying, it doesn't feel like much kindness to lead us into the wilderness. But the overarching theme of what we see in God's leading is his patience, his kindness, and his faithfulness to his people even when they don't understand it, see it, notice it, or realize it. Because what do we see in in the preceding passages here in in, uh, uh, Exodus 13? You see that God would lead them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That everywhere they're going, I want you to imagine for a moment that you walk out the church today and you, you walk out and there's a pillar of clouds covering you and a pillar of fire by night to lead you and guide you every step that you would take. Wouldn't it be fairly nice if if you're struggling, what's next in your life? What what do you need to do? That everywhere you go, there's a pillar of cloud in the sky that's telling you, this is the way you need to go, right? Go this way. And at night, you've got a pillar of fire that leads you every step that you're supposed to go exactly where you need to be. Wouldn't you, like me, think that if God were to be so gracious to you and send a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, wouldn't you say, if this were to be in my life, there would be no moment that I wouldn't trust and depend and follow the Lord wherever he would lead, right? This would be a sure sign that God is with me, right? And I would go with him. I would follow him wherever he would go. I would trust that he's with me because after all, his covering is over me day and night. And so surely I would trust in and follow his protection and providence. Surely so, right? You would think that way about the Israelites, but you would see over and over And over and over again, even with the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, they still wrestle with following the Lord's lead. But let's move from God's leading to God's provision, which is the bulk of our time this morning. God's provision. 
And I want you to look in your Bibles and Exodus chapter 14, you see in verse eight, a, a curious little statement. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. Verse eight, it says that the Israelites were going out defiantly, right? I want you to imagine for 430 years, your people have been in captivity and all of a sudden you are free to go. I mean, defiantly kind of looks like they are high-fiving each other. They're hugging, they're singing songs. They're telling the Egyptians bye. They're running out there, probably putting up an L to the Egyptians being like, our God won, y'all lost, we're out of here. Peace out, everybody, we're out, right? I mean, they're going out defiantly against Pharaoh. Verse eight, they're leaving defiantly. You take a few more verses, the Egyptians pursued them. But Pharaoh drew drew near in verse 10, and the Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. What a shift. You're leaving captivity, all is well. Everything's good. We've been praying for this. Lord, we're out of here. We're leaving captivity. Isn't this awesome? We're leaving defiantly. We're looking at Pharaoh saying, look at our God. Look what he did, right? Y'all took the L. We took the W. This is awesome. You see the might and splendor of our God. We're out of here, Egyptians. And the further away they get from Egypt, when they look back and see Pharaoh's army coming, that defiant nature turns into quivering knees. They begin to be fearful and afraid. The defiance in who God is and what he's done for them turns into fear and trembling and trepidation at the sight of their armies coming after them. So let's look at God's provision to them. That the Egyptians, the Israelites would go to Moses and they would say, Moses, it would be better off if we were dead. Moses, was there not tombs out in Egypt for us to be buried in? Moses, how could you lead it? We told you this was going to happen back in Egypt. Moses, how could you, man? This is terrible. Moses, why would you lead us out here to die? And Moses, Moses gives a threefold answer that I think is mighty helpful for us this morning. Number one, Moses responds to the people Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Put these down on your sheet of paper this morning. Don't be afraid. As the Israelites are looking and saying, Moses, look at the army. They're coming to get us. Moses, don't you see we're going to die out here? Moses, they're going to take us back to captivity. Moses, do you see the fear? Moses, they're coming to get us. These are the chariots. These are the horsemen that we've heard about for years. These are the people coming to get us. Moses, don't you see them? They look terrible. They look menacing. They're coming to get us, Moses. We've got nowhere to go but the Red Sea and the mountains. We've got nowhere to go. They're going to kill us. And Moses, with defiance, says, do not be afraid. Even today, we see God tell, tell us, God's given you not a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. In the face of certain fear, in the face of certain things, the best words that God can give us at times are simply, do not be afraid. This morning, can I just give you those simple words, do not be afraid? Maybe, maybe there's things in your life that you are fearful of. Maybe you're walking into a season right now and you are afraid. Maybe you're fearful of trusting in God's goodness and his faithfulness to you. Maybe you're just simply nervous about the ramifications of what's happening. Can I tell you the same word that God has spoken to people all throughout scripture? Do not be afraid. And if you feel less than because you need to hear those words, Abraham needed to hear it in Genesis chapter 15. Isaac needed to hear it in Genesis chapter 26. Jacob needed to hear it in Genesis chapter 46. Mary needed to hear it when she was about to give birth. That all throughout scripture, you see the angels of the Lord and God's word himself would come and say, do not be afraid. And this morning, as you face what feels like overwhelming issues in your life, so often our go-to is fear trepidation and a lack of trust in God's goodness and his faithfulness to you. Can I just simply remind you this morning, do not be afraid. God's given you not a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control.
Secondarily to this, Moses would say, do not be afraid. And he would also say, stand firm. Stand firm. Moses says, fear not, stand firm. What are they standing on? As the Israelites are looking, standing firm, seeing the the Egyptian army coming their way, Moses says, stand firm. What are they standing on? They're standing on the reality of the promise of God. They're standing firm on the reality of the promise that God said that he was going to deliver them out of captivity. They're standing firm on the promise that God says, and he's going to do what he says he was going to do. They're standing firm on the truth and the promise of God. They're looking at the Israelites, or the uh, Egyptians square in the face, recognizing that they don't have armies, they don't have power, they don't have chariots, they don't have horsemen, they don't have the things, they don't have the stuff. They're looking square in the face of death and captivity and all they've got is the promise of God. And Moses says, stand firm. Don't stand firm in the weapons you fashion. Don't stand firm in your own strength. Stand firm in the promise of the Lord to release you from captivity and take you to the promised land. Stand firm. In this world that we live in today, friends, what we do is we stand firm on the authority and the truth of God's word. When everything around us feels like it's raging and it feels like there's just, there's mess everywhere, what do you stand firm on? Not your truth, but the truth. You you stand firm in the bedrock anchor of the word and God's word and his promise to us. If it's true from his word, then it's true for us to stand on. And so Moses would say, stand firm and watch the salvation of the Lord. Stand firm and watch. Now, I want want to stop for a moment because I want to give old Mo his, his, his crown for a second. Right, Moses is 80 years old. If I did the math, Moses lived to be 120. So in, in our days, with a lifespan of about 78 for a man, uh, Moses has lived about 60-something percent of his life. And so he would be about a 55, 60-year-old. And he is leading the people out of captivity into the promised land. The last time we saw Moses, remember Moses was the guy... He, killed the guy, remember that whole little ordeal, killed the guy, and then he left and tended some flocks for a little while. God called him back by the burning bush, and did Moses go saying, yes, Lord, I'm in. No, no, Moses was like, no, Lord, I'm out. No, Lord, I can't do this. No, Lord, you don't know what you're doing. No, Lord, this isn't right. No, Lord, I can't do this, right? And then he came back, and he said, no, Lord, this isn't right. No, Lord, you've messed up. I think it was seven times, is that what we talked about? But I think Omo gets a little bit of credit here. In the midst of the Israelites coming to him and saying, you messed up. Moses, how dare you take us out? Do you see Moses, 80-year-old Moses, look the Israelites in the face and the Egyptians who are coming, and he says, do not be afraid. Stand firm and watch the salvation of the Lord. Doesn't this feel like Moses has recognized the might and mighty power of the Lord? And Moses is standing defiantly and saying, no, no, no. Do you remember what happened? Do you remember the plagues? Do you remember the the killing of the firstborn? Do you remember the flies and the gnats and the frogs? Do you remember the serpent turning from the staff? Do you remember all that God did? Do we think that he would leave us out here to die? No, be strong, be firm, and watch. Moses at 80 is not too old to stand firm on the promises of God. Moses at 80 years old is not too weak to lead the people out of their captivity. Moses at 80 is not too old to learn from his mistakes and defiantly stand and lead the people forward. Verse 17. In verse 15, excuse me, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, The Lord said to Moses, after Moses has delivered this to the Israelite people, the Lord says to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. I'm a big fan of this line right here in the scripture. Hey, Moses, why why do you keep crying out? It's go time. Let's go. Just go. God's telling Moses, hey, why do you keep, why y'all keep talking? Let's go. It's go time. 
Let's walk forward, right? Stretch out your hand and in just a moment, you're gonna see the, the waves part and you're gonna walk forward on dry land. Isn't this astonishing? That the guy would simply say, hey, let's walk, let's go. I, I know it looks fearful, I know you're scared, I know you're nervous, but hey, let's go, let's walk. In the midst of all this, as we talk about leaving captivity, I wanna pause for just a moment. I, I find it fascinating that the Israelites for 430 years for the for generations and after generations, they've been praying for captivity to cease. They've been crying out to the Lord, Lord, take us from this captivity, remove us from this slavery. And the moment God does it, the moment God does it, all they wanna do is go back to it. Say, God, please release me from this captivity. God does, and all they want to do, God, bring us back. Take me back to what I know and what's familiar, what's comfortable to me, even if it is bondage and chains. And I want to deposit this in your soul because over the course of the next several weeks as we unpack Exodus, you're going to see this theme play out over and over and over again, how difficult it can be for us to let the Lord remove the bondage of captivity from our souls. Do you feel this? Do you feel this with sin in your life? That you recognize, Lord, take these from me. And you say, Lord, I'm releasing these. But sometimes we just hold on to them too tight and we don't give them to the Lord. Say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross to save me from all my sins. But I still kind of want to hold on to some of these because they're comfortable for me. Israelites consistently want to go back to their captivity that they prayed for God to release them from. And so let me deposit this into your soul for today and we'll pick up that train in the coming weeks. Number three on your outline as we conclude this morning is God's victory. God's victory. As the Israelites are walking across, I want you to imagine for a moment the last time that you were at the beach. I want you to imagine you're at the beach and all of a sudden in the midst of the beach, the, the two sides of the water just roll to either side and you walk out into the ocean on not wet sand, not muddy sand, but on dry land. I mean, tr try for a moment and the best you possibly can just to imagine as an Israelite what this must have felt like and been like for you to look and see the Egyptians behind you and you see the water in front of you and in a moment, in an instant, you see the waves part and you're walking across on dry land. You, you see, this testifies to God's power and his might and his splendor, so much that he would say in chapter 14 of verse four, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts that the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. We, we've looked at this from a couple different perspectives, but I want you to ask, if you're an Egyptian right now and you've just watched the plagues take place in your land, if you've just watched the Lord do those magnificent 10 plagues in your land, are you pursuing the Israelites? You feel pretty good about those odds. Yet somehow the confusion sets in and the hardened of their hearts and they go out after the Israelites. And the Bible makes it clear that not a single Israelite is killed and not a single Egyptian is spared. W once again, God has won his victory. And it is, it's at this point that you begin to look at this story. And as we go through the next several weeks, you're, you're going to begin to see how in the world, after seeing all that the Israelites have seen over and over and over again, how would you ever forget God's faithfulness to you? If you're an Israelite and you've seen the plagues, you've seen the Red Sea, you've crossed on dry ground, you've seen the waters on either side, surely at this point, the pillar of fire and cloud by night, surely at this point you say, wherever he leads, I'll go, right? Uh, great is his faithfulness, surely and truly, because I've seen it with my own eyes. And it's at those moments when you get angry at the Israelites for not seeing it and recognize it that you have to point the finger back at each of us to see how often have we experienced and been in and, and just marveled at the goodness of the Lord. 
you've been through a moment and season in your life that said, man, God was faithful to me here. I'll never forget his faithfulness. And somehow it moves from I'm defiant to I'm fearful. How many times does God bring you to something and you say, this is the time that he's not gonna pull me through. This is the time that God's not gonna lead me through. And all the while you've got a, a train of memories behind you of stories and instances where God has been faithful and faithful and faithful. You get to a new one and you say, this is the time. This is the time where God's not gonna do it. If I can give you anything to deposit in your soul this morning, it's from the words of Moses. Do not fear, stand firm, and watch the salvation of the Lord over you. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for your word which does not return void to us. Thank you for your kindness that in seasons of our life you detour us in ways that are for our good and for your glory. Thank you for your leading in our lives, that your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Thank you for Moses' words to a fearful people, that as we face challenges on every side, that we can indeed stand firm and fear not. For you are fighting the battles that we cannot fight. Lord, thank you for the victory that you have won. That you released the people from captivity and you released us from captivity of all of our sins. There is one who is better than Moses who would one day come and who would lead his people from death to life. Lord, we love you. It's the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. At the bottom of your outline, you see Moses' song of victory. We'll talk about it a little bit more next week, but in 15 verse 2, it says, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. I want you to fill in that word, become my salvation, but because for Moses and the Israelites, the Lord has become their salvation. He has saved them from certain doom and death. He has become their salvation because he has led them out of captivity. He has become their salvation. They stand on him and in him and through him because he has become their Lord and God. It's possible this morning that you are struggling with the reality of what's going on in your life. You're struggling with what's happening in your soul. You're struggling with just something and you need the Lord to become your salvation. You need to allow the Lord to become your champion and your fighter. Maybe this morning you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you need to have Jesus in your life. Maybe you need to be baptized or join the church, whatever it may be this morning in your decision-making process. Don't leave this place with unfinished business. We're gonna sing this morning as we've sung the past several weeks, great is thy faithfulness. And we've used these words almost like a rallying cry to leave, to remind one another, great is your faithfulness. So I would encourage you to sing this morning, not out of turning the page, but out of conviction for your soul to say, Lord, you are faithful. Maybe you spend the time counting your blessings of his faithfulness over the past, but simply singing this morning, great is thy faithfulness and wrestling with the decision that you may have. Let's stand and let's sing. And